very much, Chachik. That was really a very passionate, very intense talk. And I, I share with you, you took up my challenge, and you did actually came, come up with it. You came up with a new narrative. And that's always been in my mind that we don't need to, um, we have the hidden Armenians, which is a completely new narrative that, that we can address in many different ways. And not even Armenians. You can, I think you can return to Western Armenia, where our ancestors are, our ancestors are from, and work with the Kurds or Turks, whoever is there, because that's the continuity. And we can find that continuity if we find these new areas. So thank you very much, Khachik, for that. Next up, Steric Nazarian. Thank you. Thank you, Bolaret Vachajan, for this amazing conference. Um, my name is Eric Nazarian. I'm a filmmaker, writer, uh, former photojournalist. And today, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about this conference, and especially our panel, and what Khachik so eloquently hit on so many multiple um, themes, the complexities, the beauties, the poetries, <laughs> and the uh, absurdities and the profanities that we all go with. Um, so I'm actually hijacking the conversation. I'm going to talk about 1960s girl groups. Uh, we're not talking about death. We're going to talk about dancing. I'm kidding. The reason why I wanted to start with this image is because the concept of imagination is something that is very near and dear to my heart. I've been blessed for many years to earn my bread through my imagination as a writer, as a filmmaker. And I believe that just like your heart and your lungs and your kidneys and your spleen, every single one of you here and every single human being in this world has been given an imagination. We don't know if it's here, if it's here, if it's here, if it's here. It exists somewhere in the crossroads of what, who you were born to, what happened to you, and what you did with the time you had. So starting with this idea of Western Armenia, um, it's very important for me to begin with this theme of the Shangri-Las, because it's one of my favorite girl groups from the 60s, but more importantly, Pop culture really inspired me to start doing research you know, on the Encyclopedia Britannica when I was in my teens and 20s because I wanted to know where these terminologies came from. And Shangri-La is a term that comes from this film, Lost Horizon, that Frank Capra did that was based on James Griffin's book from the 30s, which was about these group of foreigners that end up crashing in the Himalayas and looking for this mythical lost place called Shangri-La. And the idea how pop culture and how human mythology continues to create, artists are constantly obsessed with this lost kingdom, this lost paradise, this imaginary place of heaven and earth, this lost Eden that Ara was talking about earlier. And going from Shangri-La, Xanadu, Shangri-La, which Frank Capra was also inspired by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who wrote this beautiful poem about Kublai Khan's, you know, in Kublai Khan's decree, uh, Xanadu was this place of king, now in modern day China, it's Shangdu, but Xanadu became this place of paradise, of peace, where they dined on milk and honeydew. And basically, from that, Olivia Newton-John created her musical. And this concept of paradise lost continued to evolve through pop culture with groups like Rush and them singing the song of Xanadu. This concept of paradise continuing and evolving, transcending borders and generations. I mean, these are very oriental, very ancient themes and ideas. Why do they have a place in our public pop culture consciousness now, in the 80s, 90s, and 20s? And this is one of my favorite movies of all time, Citizen Kane. And Citizen Kane named his paradise, his home, his mansion, Xanadu. And as you can see, Xanadu uh, in the uh, crystal ball, which is his childhood, and in that amazingly gothic image of the K, and in that lost kind of shrouded, you know, Edgar Allan Poe-esque image, you have a place that is constantly forbidding and forbidden. And the concept of paradise is meant to be open. It's meant to be borderless, boundaryless, open roads. But the idea of what you see in these pop cultural images of paradise and paradise lost is constantly this place of protection and fortification from the outside world, from evil, which is basically that's on the horizon over there, and from the fallen angels. And this whole theme of good and evil, Paradise Lost, goes back to you know, John Milton and this, his epic poem, Paradise Lost, that then Gustav Dore in the Middle Ages, in the late Middle Ages, created. So all this has a point, because this all goes into this image of 
you know, the profane on the ground and the heavenly in the sky and the angels coming to liberate mankind from the man-made hell on earth that once upon a time was heaven. And all these images, for me as an Armenian, the Armenian Shangri-La, the Armenian Xanadu is Western Armenia. It was this lost, destroyed, obliterated paradise that I grew up with, and I'm not a Western Armenian. I was born in Hayastan. My parents were born in Tehran. My ancestries are from Banbas, Buragan, Araratian, Tashtavar, the Araratian plain. And they were forced migrated across the Araks River. So I grew up with this lost kingdom a couple of hundred years before um, the genocide actually happened. That old saying my grandfather used to say, Meshki sur timatis juj, how they forced Masha Abbas's Safavid Empire, forced migrated 200,000 of my ancestors into Persia in 1604, after the Safavid Ottoman Wars. So this idea of this, this paradise on earth that is forbidden, because Armenians in pro Armenia proper cannot cross over into Western Armenia. I wanted to also include this, because this I took, uh, th I was sitting in Avedi Gisakian's chair this summer, and this is his home museum. And this is the image that he sat to and he wrote to every day. And it's an Armenian prince basically warding off the invaders that are coming to get him. And this was very eloquently and ma magnificently uh, wo woven together. But this was the image he would wake up to and have his coffee and write to every day. From Abu Lala Mahari to the verses of Bingyol, the great song that we all know now and that's being sung by Kardash Turjuler. It's being sung from all Armenians, Haik Yazjan. This whole... This man sat in his room and he had an image of his paradise lost, the paradise that he needs to fortify. Obviously, with the great painter Fendekcan, you have you know, the Sasuntsi mother with the child in her arm and the rifle hiding out. And this was very clearly inspired by the genocide. And continuously, this concept of the ruination of paradise, the destruction, the desecration, what was paradise that is now profane? The ruins of Ani. Everything Armenians talk about when it pertains to our ancestors has an element of ruination, of destruction, of annihilation, and of exile in it. And how this seeds us in our own DNA. These three pictures I want to show because this is clearly somewhere in the vicinity of what Khachik was talking about, of Kars and in Western Armenia, of again, this idea of the erosion constantly, the erosion. The constant destruction, the constant erosion of time, of identity, and of home. And it's interesting, all the images that I grew up with seeing of Western Armenia, of all that was paradisical, was vertical. And then you cut to the genocide, and Armenians are portrayed in horizontal lines, predominantly as victims, as be, being marched as caravans, as dead bodies, and dead ex as exiles, as skull and bones, from Derzor all the way to the, to, to the unreachable plains of, of Dudan, the 250-foot crevasse that Khachik was talking about that we visited twice. And obviously, these images continue to um, be the, yin, the, the profanity to the poetry of this home that was lost. And what's in, interesting for me is, you know, when I had the chance to go to uh, Bolis for the first time, I had an invitation from a company that was associated with the European Union um, Capital of Culture, and they invited uh, f five filmmakers from around the world to come and make a film about their cultural roots in Istanbul. And they chose me to do Armenians. And I'm not a Bolsai, but I have a great deal of passion and love for all the, the golden age of the Bolsai artists and poets and musicians and obviously all the names that you very well know. But to me, this idea of going back to Turkey went back to this image because this was the first image that was created in American public consciousness in 1919 of ravished Armenia. That I'm going back to encounter these Turks with fezes and sabers in their hands, ready to annihilate because clearly the genocide continues with the assassination of the late beloved Hernan Dink. And so this was the image, again, the visualization of paradise and profanity and what Armenia represented to my diasporan psyche that I felt was really a complex I either had to confront now or forever hold my peace and continue to face this issue with closed fists. And as a filmmaker, as you very well know, if you walk in and try to direct a movie with closed fists, you can't frame your shots. So I had to really overcome my own anger, my rage, as well as my readiness to kick somebody's ass when I docked there, which happened quite a few times on the verge of, but I had to deal with this complex. I had to kind of deprogram myself of all the rage and the anger and the anxiety that I was feeling. And being grown in and around the areas of East LA and LA, you know, you had to prove your manhood on your enemy's territory, not in your own safe ground. And so I felt this was a chance to go alone and see if I could muster making a movie 
with 40, 45 Turks and Kurds of a generation that I had nothing, no first-hand knowledge about. And I stipulated in my contract that it had to be a film that uses the word genocide, soykırım, and it's, and it's distributed and subtitled as soykırım across Turkey. If that was not going to happen, I was not going to do the movie. And I got what I wanted. I had my cake and I ate it too, and the film got distributed. <laughs> but, but I realized something. All that I went there with, this rage and anger, came from the reality that all these images that I grew up with, and not just these images of ravished Armenia, was that I felt like there's an old saying that you do not get a second chance to make a first impression. And the danger of images, as well as the, act, the, the amazing profundity of this potential, is that the Armenian Genocide became the first crime against humanity to be documented photographically in the era of portable photography. You had the Civil War, you had all the Boer Wars, but the actual time when the birth of the motion picture, David W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, happened in 1915, when it was the murder of our nation. So you had, this was the cause du jour, this was Near East, Clara Barton the multi, multi, multi millions and millions of dollars that the Near East Relief did. The images of Armenians was slam dunked and tattooed in the consciousness of America and in the world press as a starving, landless, exiled, destroyed people of Christians who are completely wiped out. Hence the term starving Armenians. So all this iconography, these stereotypes that have been conditioned came from this time, came from the time of ravished Armenia. And as time went on, as Filmmaking started out so big and monstrous with such massive casts of 10,000s. And now we make movies on our iPhones. We make movies on the smallest, tiniest little gadgets. And guess what? We can upload it and disseminate it you know, to 150 and 200 countries worldwide. Um, so this idea was trying to go to Bolis and make a film that I can break through my own chains and my own anger and figure out if I had to make a very critical choice. Do I... Do I, as an artist, continue to hate and alienate and be angry? Or do I find something that I was going to look for, I didn't find, but I found something else? And I found out that the people that I went there ready to fight with, ultimately, became some of the dearest friends I ever had. And they confided to me that we just learned that my grandmother was Armenian. Though all of these were the kids of the hidden Armenians that Khacho was talking about. And these people were really beside me and did everything they could to make sure that I had what I needed to make this movie and that I wouldn't compromise it. And to shoot a film in five days in 14 locations in Istanbul, a city of 15, 17 million people. Umit, is that correct, 17? With the vicinity or 14? It was 14 when I went, now it's I think 17. 17. 17. It's a nightmare. And if you think LA 405 traffic sucks, you ain't been to Bodhi yet, I'll tell you. So thankfully, this was the moment where I was able to try and see if I, could, um, if I could make a film that doesn't victimize the Armenians as so much as I had seen. And you know, I sincerely believe, especially in recent times, as a filmmaker, and I'm working on probably the most important film I'll ever make in my life uh, about the genocide, you know, there's a curse on the genocide movie. There's something very, it's a curse. It's a cursed subject for a film. There's never been that one film that has been transcended its own um, its own community, its own structure. And it's, there's never been that one film outside of Ilya Kazan's America, America, which is about Greek family and the Greek immigration, which deals with the subject of the genocide. But this was really my reimagining, you know, trying to understand how I can imagine myself as a filmmaker going to these lands had a lot to do with ravished Armenia and trying to destroy my, my, um, my rage against something that I couldn't change because I can't change the genocide and I can't change who hates us but I can change who is willing to listen and learn and I felt that literacy through cinema was a cause that I found near and dear to my soul and I felt that with the blessings of technology now I can do what they did in the era of the Thomas Edison and the Nickelodeon but I could do it with portable and I could do it with a sincerity for people that wanted to learn and it's a very hard step going against that tide but it was something very fundamental for me to understand and for me to deal with my own complexes. And this is an image of uh, Dikran Agir from the Mount, from the walled city, where again, it's when we first went to this, and when I first saw these images and a couple of the other images I'll show you, 
this was, you know, I had written the script already, we had started the storyboards, I had visualized the whole thing, and so it was important for, on that first journey with Chris and Kacho and our friend George, to really see if my actual uh, un, un, unknowledgeable brain that had never seen any of these landscapes made actual sense with my storyboards, had I imagined it correctly. And again, when you go there, you see it, you, I felt like a native foreigner, but at the same time, I felt so connected to this land, even though I'm not Western Armenian, I can, I, it, there was something very gothic about that landscape, something so profane and yet something so profound because you're, you're realizing for the first time as a diasporan that you have a chance to see things that your grandparents never saw, their parents probably never saw, and you're, re, you're living with lands where every s step of the way, I'm wondering, did this person's grandfather kill how many Armenians? Did that person's, you know, did this, is this woman Armenian? Is this woman Kurdish? Is this woman? You go through this entire s inner consciousness, inner monologue, and you're constantly self-conscious as an Armenian when you're in these lands because, you know, Istanbul is not Turkey. You know, this is Turkey. Istanbul is a blend of Europe, of the Balkans, of it's a, it's a different animal. It's a Byzantine Roman animal, Ottoman animal, and it has its own structure. But when you go into the heartland, you see, oh my God, this is Armenia. This is Western Armenia. This is the Armenia of Avedi Kisakian. This is the Armenia of Marty Rosarian. This is the Avdikian of Fendukchan. And this is an image very important to me because this we went to Soradir and this was the church that Ahtamar Island's church was modeled after that I learned from Khachik. And so you're seeing these incredible stones and yet you're trying to constantly look for the visual landscape, the image, the image that is very, very fundamental, that's going to make a pretty picture, but also tell a story. And all around me, I realized that a landscape devoid of people is, is, is still home, but at the same time, it is no way to, as an Armenian, find peace within yourself if you are not able to experience it firsthand. If they, the people, the natives who know you're Armenian returning, if they don't know that you care for this and that you will be back, that those stones, those churches, those valleys, those fortresses, they, are, they might as well be in oblivion. So for me, it's important to return as much as I can because I don't want these rocks and these orchards and these valleys on a symbolic level. And as a filmmaker, I'm a very emotional person, definitely not rational because it's an insane business to be in. But to me, I speak with these landscapes, and with these la these landscapes speak to me. They're, they're definitely our voices, but they're not voices like Joan of Arc voices. There's a different type of subterranean emotion you feel, and you feel it with a lot of anger. I'm not going to lie. I mean, there's I mean, this is Palu, and this is our friend George's village, and you're seeing nothing but emptiness, and you're wondering what did these mountains see before your time. Is it capable? Are you capable to make a film? Is it possible to make a film that does justice to the magnitude and intensity of what had happened here? And so you're struggling with your own sense of uh, well-earned doubt because you're, n no one can do one film about the genocide and say this is the be-all end-all. I wish there were 500 films about the genocide from 500 filmmakers around the world in a way that transcends our narrative. But going there and seeing this, I was surrounded by so much beauty. I mean, this is Khulavank in uh, Harpert. Um, this is um, Khulavank, it was desecrated. There was a Nazi swastika in the back. You know, this is Chunkush, the Armenian church, which we were arguing, right, if it's possibly a little bit smaller than the, than the Surkiragos in Digranagir, which is probably a little bit smaller. But against time, against bombs, why did these structures, these foundations stay? I mean, who can answer that? Why didn't they wipe us all out completely? Why didn't these, these structures that have no purpose for anybody remain? It's the obstinacy, it's the stubbornness, and it's the defiance of nature, one. But it's also, there's something distinctively Western Armenian about this. And this is why we go back. We go to document what's happening. We go to find it. This is my favorite place of sanctuary. This is St. Bartholomew on the border of Iran in Vasburakan, in the deep, deep, this is where St. Bartholomew was martyred. And this place was forbidden since the 60s because the Turkish military had an outpost here. Nobody has been to this place until recently. It was about two, three years ago, Khaj. And there you go. All these holes you see at the bottom right there, they're all target practice. And it was dynamited. It was dynamited mercilessly, but it stayed. And I felt that when I keep questioning my own inner Ararat, like what, what is it that keeps you going 
when you go there, you see this. The, the, the images provide the unspoken narrative. You, you find that these images will continue to tell stories because images outdate written language as storytelling. Back in the days when monks were trying to educate people about Christianity, there was no written grammar. There was oral storytellers and men who drew images on walls and hieroglyphs. So image making now, as John luc Godard said, everything has become cinema because we are able to document, we're able to braid narratives, we're able to disseminate those narratives. And through that dissemination, you're able to find a different part of your identity that you didn't know you had. And this is Garm Ravank in Vaughan. And again, this, you know, the, 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 the stubbornness, the defiance of nature against time continuing to stand, despite the desecrations, despite all the grave robbers and the gold robbers, despite all that which needs to be addressed. There needs to be a conference about what the people can do in the Kurdish municipalities to help stop this. Like, this is absolutely outrageous. People need to pay attention to what's happening because it is an utter nightmare when you go there and you see seven, eight different types of holes. I mean, Chris almost fell into one when we were going when we, right here. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. You're just seeing this mad, obsessed obsession with this Armenian gold. And from that desecration, you look at this, and this is Gudutz, and it looks like Hawaii. You know, it could be very well Kauai. I mean, look at this. This could be Kauai, or this could be Tahiti, but this is our ancestral land. So you're, 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 you're constantly battling this, this, again, going back to Milton, this paradise lost, paradise found, innocence experience. And from that paradise, you go to Dudan, and you see, again, all that cannot be changed, but all that must be, all that you must experience a witness to get as full of a story as you can. And Asiya, obviously, Hacho spoke about her in depth, so I'm not going to bore you. He's much more eloquent than I am. Um, but I think what, what, to me, what Asiya represents is the, the, the inevitable loss of that generation, and she's going to be 100 next year. She was basically 40 or 45 days old when they threw her uh, father in this pit and the Turkish gendarme that was in charge saw her mother with a siya in her hand and pulled her out of the line. So 99 years ago, heads were smashed, bones were broken, and I'm not going to waste your time doing a diatribe. I don't need to get into the profanity of what's already been experienced. But this woman now, as a result of that, Faithful encounter has a grandson who's basically helping to clean up the church. So there is nothing irrelevant in what you do as an army. I mean, I'm a human being first, and I agree with David Barsami what he said yesterday. But who's very, very proud to be Armenian. But my my um, my cultural identity doesn't. I don't want to permit that from forbidding myself to experience what I'm culturally and and historically entitled to. And without that knowledge, I don't think I can evolve as an Armenian. Without seeing these, this soil, seeing the rage and anger, and experiencing the racism in Turkey, because I spent quite a lot of time in Bolis. And from this profanity of these desecrated churches, we have now reconstruction. And I've spoken too much in de detail about desecration and ravage and destruction, but you're seeing now in Surkiragos, you're seeing in the, you know, in Digranagir, the Arabic here, you're seeing a concerted, sincere effort. You know, I mean, the Kurdish parliament in exile's first tend to correct me if I'm wrong, Khacho, is to recognize the Armenian genocide. You know, so these are things we need to know because knowledge is power. And through that power, create the confidence to be able to go and return to what is rightfully ours and should be respected and disseminated through imagination to knowledge. And this was an image I took of Khacho's hand on the left and a villager who randomly saw us and just walked up to us and said, these are from your grandfathers. And that was it. This, what, it was like a 16-year-old, 15-year-old kid, right? And so this was Khacho, Chris, and myself um, in St. Bartholomew, right where the, the, the dome was dynamited in the 60s. And it, you feel rooted, and, I, and, I, and there's, there's a sadness, there's a, there's, a, there's a beauty, but there's also a tragedy. But it helps you kind of find, and this is the Buddha of Palu. This is Khachik Muradian. He owns Western Armenia. <laughs> I have to throw this in there. Because <laughs> he's my hero. I call him the god. Me and Chris call him the godfather. So <laughs> he's Don Khacho Corleone. <laughs> Anyway, it's a good angle. Che, are, you, are you satisfied? Huh? Can I? May I? Shalom again.
And again, I, I don't know why I always go back to Avedi Gisakian, just this idea of an old man of letters sitting there writing in the confines of Soviet Armenia. And his mind was so free, he could write about Bingyo, he could write about the caravans of Abu Lala Mahari, he could write about anything he wanted. He didn't let the Iron Curtain or the border or the fortress or all of man-made disasters that have constantly persecuted and destroyed artists. You know, a Turkish friend of mine once told me, he said, if, 20, if 1915 was in 2015, all you artists would be the first to go. Because without the arts, the story dies. And without the constant preservation of oral storytelling, what Hacho's doing, what I love so much, and what all my friends are doing, what Ara's doing, you know, no matter the landscape, um, no matter the landscape, uh, the landscape means nothing without human presence. If we are not there to witness, to experience it, it means nothing. The story cannot be told. It's trees and leaves and stones cannot tell what happened to them. And if those walls had ears and hands, the book they would write would be a stack full of pages from here to freaking the rings of Saturn. And still it wouldn't be enough. So the magnitude of all of this you know, fermented in me this need to just, like a wolf and a complete monomaniacal um, madman, to jump off the cliff and see if I could get this movie made based on Chris's beautiful book. And so these are the first time I'm actually showing these images of the sand castles that I did with my team in Mexico. And these were the images that I'm trying to braid and bring to life, which, thank God, we're moving at a very good pace. And, and God willing, in the next year or two, it'll be ready. That said, I'm not in any way, shape, or form in a rush to finish this film by 2015. I think all the, you have to make a good film, and without a good film, it, your story means nothing if it's destroyed and if it's, if, if it's half-baked. We can't fail this time. I mean, all, with all due respect to all the filmmakers who have tried in the past, and I deeply respect all their efforts for all the obvious reasons. But now it's for, so important for me because I don't know the more I've spent, you know, two and a half, three years, every morning, noon, and night, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, living in the genocide. The amount of research, the images, Aleppo, Derzor, everything that Hachos taught me, everything that we I've gone, it's enough to a point to drive you mad. It's enough to, to drive you mad because you are living in the utter mouth of hell and understanding that human beings have done so many things that nobody is being held accountable for. And then the fateful irony of life is you're in Western Armenia and then you see Mount Sinjar and the Yazidis being slaughtered and you see ISIS coming up. You see the micro war in Azerbaijan. All this is going on, which goes back to Lord Byron saying, you know, history hath many of volumes and it's vast, but it's all one page. Because ultimately, if we don't, you know, again, back to Santayana and what, to just braid in what David was talking about, you know, if you don't know the past and you don't really live it in the present, you know, you're doomed to repeat it. If you're not going to repeat it, somebody else is. And obviously you can't negotiate with madmen who want to basically slaughter, but you have, you have to understand this, and this is again going back to the genocide. And obviously, this was the first image I drew of the, it's of our men returning from Vaughan and seeing basically his village wiped out in the provinces of Harper. And as we were drawing this, I, I did this image, and then when we went to Western Armenia, I realized, despite the beauty of it, it needed to be a little dirtied up a, a, a bit more because the, 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 the idea of a, you know, a voyage of these landscapes, I realized it wasn't so much the landscapes that will tell the story, but it's the human touch. It's what happens to humanity. This is the sets for Aleppo of the American compound, the Armenian orphanage, and the tent city, and all the background will be CGI. So you'll get a, for me, it's the most important thing for this film to have a desert palette. And this really, to the authenticity of the dust and the humanitarian chaos that was Aleppo, with Elizabeth's character, who's at the, from the Near East Relief, who comes to Aleppo and basically sees the caravans and the battalions of women coming. So this was really, it was important for me to share this with you because it all dovetails in, it all funnels in with this theme of the ravaged, lost paradise, lost homeland, and this need to recreate you know, what has happened in a way that just doesn't, I don't want to just say, look what happened to this, look, they slashed babies. I don't, I don't care about that. That's not important for me, okay? Anybody can do 10 movies about vice like this, but it's more important for me, why in the middle of all this chaos and insanity, why would a human being still want to continue? Just like Ara's genocide survivors did. That is to me what this movie is about. That is to me. Why does love exist when you have the most utter, disgusting, profane human horror committed upon you left, right, and center? 
And without that love, without that love for surviving, for not just as Armenians, but as human beings, to create, to make something of your life in the time that you're given in your life, as Saroyan said, you know, we have nothing more than the time that we've been given to do something constructive. And I don't want to continue to hate. I want to love through images. And I want to continue to go back to Istanbul and to Western Armenia and to continue to break this narrative and help build bridges with my Turkish and Kurdish colleagues. Because I feel that's where I can be instructive. And this image is so important for me, the iconic image of this boy whose paradise was ravaged and lost, and whose mother who died, who walked to Eshmiyazin, who ended up a remarkable expressionist in New York. But again, the lost paradise, no matter where he went, he returned back to the root of his womb. And so it's very important that he didn't continue to paint his mother's hands. It's important that he kept it without that detail, because it's something you could never fully recover. We could never recover what we've lost. I don't forgive. How do you forgive a genocide? No, forget forgiveness. We're beyond that. Just like Edmund said, we're not in the, we're, it's not about recognition. It's already recognized. It's about reparation. It's about justice. But it's also about knowledge through visual education and audiovisual literacy. That said, all these images for me, back to love and back to the look in the eye and the, the secrets that those eyes hide that they don't want to be let out. There is no greater landscape and all the landscapes we've seen from Pacho's beautiful images, Ara's, all the images you've seen, you know, landscapes will remain landscapes. But for me, the most beautiful landscape of all, just like Pacho's children, is the human face and what the human eye captures. And my whole life is that struggle to find how I can photograph the human face that tells that story. And I want to end just before with Asiya this image because, you know, when I first went to Turkey, we, you know, every time I talk about the Armenian genocide, you know, we, uh, you know my Turkish colleagues would say, yeah, we understand, like, for you it was yesterday, for you it was yesterday. And then this beautiful young kid who was murdered on April 24th, some, a few years ago, after um, Sevak Balikci's murder on April 24th, it was, the genocide is not yesterday, it's today. And this is not to be the eternal pessimist, which I'm not, this is what scares and ravages me, is that there's a whole beautiful group of civil society members and artists and people trying to do these workshops, and Barshner Gadar for doing this amazing workshop, and the Hrant Dink Foundation, and Taner, and Wolfgang Gus, and all these wonderful people that come together to create this dialogue. But those people are 1% of a population that still is convinced that Armenians are the eternal enemy. And those mindful people that are constantly doing and struggling to break free from these chains, you have to support that because these are the causes worth fighting for. And it's very, very important that through knowledge and through literacy and through intercultural exchange, you can destroy you know, the lies and the ignorance that continues to perpetuate. Because I was there when uh, Erdogan made that racist statement that he had been called something worse in Armenia. And I've never felt more lonely and more confused in my life, even though I was surrounded by love and Armenians and my Turkish friends and colleagues calling me, apologizing, this isn't Turkey, this isn't Turkey. But you have to understand, like, there's a different beast that is out there. And, you know, we, the, the fight continues for justice, for reparations, but you need to know the enemy you're fighting. And when you go there, you understand it, then you kind of reframe how you can be more effective and more tangibly produce results. But at the end of the day, the reparations, the cause, the genocide, everything that this conference talked about goes back to, for me, to this image that this is still continuing. And unless we figure out a tangible way to build dialogue with the right people and continue the struggle, there's no end in sight on the eve of the centennial. So I really hope that through literacy and through culture and dialogue, we're going to be able to continue what we're all dedicated to, but at the same time, not being naive or deluded that we're, that this is all going to, that, that 2015, everything's going to be okay. Like, the genocide's going to get re recognized for 2016 to 2017. Like, this is the long haul. But, you know, cultural literacy, I think, is the right way to continue this fight, as well as the politicking of it as well as Washington, as well as the international courts. Thank you very much.